I just wanted him to do well as obviously me being an Englishman, a man that's managed out there, he's well renowned there to come and do well because it sets precedence for me in the fact that, oh wow, these English players, staff or players can kind of come here and do well. You know, but ultimately, like you said, I think being at a football club like Apple if the results don't go in the right way, you're going to leave and get sat. That's just football. Mick will know that that's part and parcel of the game, you know, but disappointed to see him go. Hello, welcome to a special edition of Shoot the Defence. I'm your host, Del, and I've got FC Buffalo Central Midfield and former Crystal Palace, Blackpool, Milton Keynes, Dons. I'm running out of teams here, Punch. How you doing, mate? <laughs> <laughs> a long list. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Nice for, nice for coming on. Thanks, no, man. thank you for, for joining me, man. I know it's a two-hour time difference in Cyprus. So it's eight o'clock, and I'm sure the weather's been good to you right now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been good. How are you finding life out there? You've been there, what, almost two years now? Is that right? Yeah, so I've been here just short, just over 18 months now. It's been it's been brilliant. It's obviously um, tough at the start on the pitch, but brilliant off the pitch. And then it goes brilliant on the pitch, and then it's been tough off the pitch, obviously, with the COVID situation. So it's mm. been sort of a... A whirlwind, but ultimately, I would say it's been more good than bad since I've been here on a personal perspective for me and my family. So, yeah, I can't complain. What's it like in terms of an educational system for your kids out there? I know they've got American academies and English is effectively a second language, soon to be Russian. (laughs) But um, how are they coping out there, making friends and all that? must have been difficult. They're quite young, no? Yeah, well, at first, you always worry about them. You know, having four children, not all children are going to settle the same, you know, so... Some of one of them was a bit slow to settle, you know, but then generally now they found their feet, you know, look, at, I'm not being funny. They, they go to squat 7.30, they finish that two o'clock, you know, and they come back, they got a swimming pool, it's sunny outside, you know, which I feel they've probably taken that a bit for granted now because now they're not outside in the pool as much and right. don't go outside as much because you're used to it. But, you know, it's a wonderful experience it's been for them. And I think school's been fine, you know, obviously them going to an international school, being able to mix with different cultures has been good for them. And obviously, the other good thing is they learn to speak Greek slowly, slowly. Edo, bravo. And I guess you've heard the term, this is Cyprus, my friend. Yes. <laughs> yes. How often do you hear that these days? The first time I was told that was on the pitch with the referee. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and I think I probably heard that for about my first 10 games um, from referees and from players. You know, but then obviously I feel like I've been part of it for a, obviously a season and a bit. And you, you play against people that are obviously competitors, but you get to know those players when you're on the pitch and those referees. Mm. So tell me something. I, I'm just guessing here, but I take it this isn't your first venture into Cyprus. Um, I'm a, yeah. I'm, I think I'm four years older than you, but I'm a big house and garage fan. So I take it you hit Napa back in the day. Am I right there? The yeah, studio? I went Napa All twice right. when I was about, I think I was... 2021 um, um and obviously at that time didn't really get to see other part of the island you know what one person that always told me about it was andros because i always looked at going on like a family mm. on the cyprus but i always assumed it was iron apple and then andros towns and he's um half cypriot so he was telling me about limassol is a lovely place and obviously you've got paphos obviously you've got nicosia and i didn't really understand all that till i came here and then coming here being able to see different parts of the island has just been fantastic you know i'm still yet to see some places that i want to go and see um, but it's been brilliant. Mm. Well, do you know, what? it's it's a bit freaky how you mentioned Andros because I was going to segue that into another discussion, to be fair, but I'm glad you brought him up because I've got a lot of friends that, and family in Cyprus and I started doing a lot of videos on Omonia at the beginning of last season. And I've gathered a little bit of a following, but I've done some videos on, on Marcus Edwards, who's at Vitoria at the moment, and he's yeah, yeah. Cyprus, like Andros. And I've spoke to his dad and I, I won't divulge on, on the podcast what he and I have spoken about. But um, same people in Cyprus that were saying to me, is Marcus Edwards Cypriot? Are the same people that said, when I said about Andros Townsend being half Cypriot, they didn't believe me. I said, you yeah. I know Troy, his dad, Troy, I know very well, but no one really talks about Andros' mum too much. And I know that Andros is very close to his family, his grandparents, his yeah, Bapu and all that. Um, so if... If Andros did choose Cyprus over England, would he have been elevated as like a legend in Cyprus? Because we don't have players like that. Okay, we've got Loizu and Johnny's breaking through, who again we'll discuss later. But ever since Costandino, Yanis or Kaz, we haven't had that big name. So yeah, would Andros have been up there with a, a legendary, legendary status like Ralfman, for example? 
if he was to transfer to Cypriot national team, you mean? Well, like if he or, did that at the beginning, because I don't think he can yeah. now, because he's played for England. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's too yeah. it's too late now. Definitely, mm. you can't. No, no disrespect to the Cypriot players. I'm not sure there's any Cypriot players that have played at that high level. The boys played Premier League consistently since he was, I think, 21. Maybe he's obviously played for England, but he's played at Tottenham, and I think definitely he'll be up there. I think that, I think that's a no brainer. You know, I think obviously. For me, that's probably one to watch in the future and hopefully graces the pictures of Cyprus. Yeah. Well, as I said, I mean, he can't play for the national team now because he's representing it represented England, but played the competitive games. But the reason I ask is because, as I said, many people were surprised when I said Andros Townsend is, is half Cypriot, you know, and I think because in Cyprus, as you know, out there, they can be a little bit backward and they can be a little bit racist, let's put it that way, because yeah. I'm, I'm just going to say, yeah. say it like it is. I agree with you. I agree, agree with out there. Yeah. Does a, yeah, yeah. Does a, it, it occurs out there a lot, to be fair. Yeah. Um, but when you, I think even now to this day, younger people still see a mixed race guy and they look at Andrew Sanza, for example, and they think, how has he got separate blood? But it happens. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it happens. happens. It happens. <laughs> I think with Andrew, so I just think he, I think for me, as a Cypriot like playing in Cyprus, I think it would be fitting, it would be wonderful if I was to see Andros out here playing in a few years' time. I, I will be honest, I think it's too early for him to come now. Mm. I think it, maybe him coming at the stages of sort of I did would be wonderful. And I think it's something that he would generally look at because what people don't realise about him, he's actually doing, um, I don't want to confuse it, he's actually doing his Greek lessons now. So he does it online to pass the language. Right. He does it online for the writing and for the speaking. So okay. he's took that upon himself. And that shows... He, what does it say? It shows intentions to come here, but that shows intention to learn the culture. Mm. Do you know? And without, I don't mean to make a joke out of this or be facetious, but when he was talking about his gambling habit, the first thing I thought he's got Cypriot blood because they yes. love a casino, you know? <laughs> yeah, they love yeah, a casino. yeah, yeah. Um, love a casino, love like a football yeah. bet. That's yeah, it. That's it. Yeah. Well, we won't talk about the football betting, shall we, in Cyprus? Because, <laughs> yeah, let's said about that, the better. But <laughs> let's talk about FC Buffer. Um, unfortunately, you guys didn't make the top six, but it's been a bit of a topsy turvy year for you guys because you started the season on the front foot. I know you drew against us on morning at the beginning of the season. You scored, although yeah. people give it as an own goal, but you know. <laughs> um, you know, and the, you started the season pretty well with Cameron Toshak, did quite well. And then you played up well, you beat them 1 0 away from home. And all of a sudden, he's got the boot. Now, yeah. for me, as an outsider looking in and reading all the reports in you know the Welsh press about how oh, he was sacked and he did so well, great statistics, this and that. Again, this is Cyprus and these things happen. So when you heard of the uh, sacking, because I know it was announced to you guys first thing in the morning because Charlie, a good friend of ours, who you know, Charlie Mitchell. Oh, yeah. Um, he, you know, he told me, he texted me first thing in the morning, he said, I've got a meeting, I've got to take the first team training session. I was like, yeah. Jesus Christ, like, you beat up well yesterday. He goes, well, yeah, these, these things happen. But how did you take it? How did the rest of the squad take it? I think it's always difficult, you know, because especially Cameron, he was a, a guy that sort of got around the squad. He wasn't a distance manager. Mm. You know, he put his arm around some players, spoke to players. You know, he had a good connection with players. It's always difficult when you lose a person like that. You know, and old, old me is a coach, but he is a person. And that was a difficult thing for us. And we had to pick ourselves back up again to try and start moving forward again. And obviously, change is never easy in football, mm. you know. And, but it's one of those things that happens. It's part and parcel of our game. It's a carousel. We know that people come and go. And ultimately, we just sort of had to get on with our jobs. Well, it's been a massive reshuffle, isn't it? Because there's a predominantly British background in terms of the backroom staff, mm. everything. And then mm. I think, was it Mihalichenko? Was that his name that came in? Yeah, 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 yeah. But he was touted as the next the next guy anyway. So it's almost as if beating up well wouldn't have kept Cameron's job. Even if it was a two or three nil victory. And you beat him with 10 men as well. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's it's always difficult to take off the back of that, you know, and people obviously, the, the football club had their agenda and what, what they're trying to do. You know, and obviously the change we we felt with Cameron, the direction was going in on a professional level, the infrastructure behind the scenes, a lot of things that people don't see in mm -hmm. a day-to-day -day professional running of a football club. We was going in the right direction. Okay, results may not have been generally great, but when you go on the back of those two results that we had, it's a signal that something could be happening for me. Yeah, absolutely. So, Mikhail Cheko comes in. And then Stephen Constantine gets the job as technical director. Now, Stephen has been around for a long time, you know, coaching in India, I think Rwanda, if I'm not mistaken. 
um, pretty well respected head coach and he got the job as a technical director and he went on TV uh, I think it was cable net and he said uh, which means top six is the target next thing you know Mikhailichenko goes Stephen Constantine gets the job as head coach so he's your third head coach of the season and again I don't think you were ever used to something maybe when you were at MK Dons if I'm not mistaken maybe you had three head coaches at time so if I'm not mistaken, that's probably the first time you've had three head coaches in the season. Is that right? Yeah, I've had... I think that's got to be... Yeah, it's got to be the first time I've had... Well, no, saying that actually at Palace we did, it was a bit weird. P- Pulis was with us for pre-season, then he left, then Walnut came. And then Pardew came in that same season. But I would say in terms of managers getting bulks of games, definitely it's basically like we've played three parts of the season hmm. with three different managers. So like the first... Quarter would have been, first third would have been with Cameron, the second third with um, Dima, and then obviously now you've got Steven. So it, it, it's been difficult, and that, obviously that always changes for players because players are in and out of the team, players are playing regularly, then players don't play regularly. It's, the dynamics obviously is not good, you know. But ultimately we are professionals, and we just, sometimes I think as footballers you've got to look at yourselves if the changes mm. happen, because it can't always be the manager's fault if the changes happen. And it, ultimately we are the eleven players, or how many other players get to get on that picture on that match day that can make it change yeah so Stephen's done pretty well um, I know you guys are challenging for like the top of the bottom half of the season people don't understand the Cypriot League it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit yeah, tricky yeah. to understand when the league splits in half and then you've yeah. got four teams that go down um, as opposed to two I think it's four this season isn't it it's four teams that yeah, go down four this season, this season. Um, and I think you guys are seventh if I'm not mistaken seventh or eighth so you're yeah, kind of, so you're kind of Apple safe. are one point, point in front of us. Well, you're not safe yet because you you got to look at the things. At Akna, they're, they're not far. They're seven points behind us. We've got to play them soon. Paralimmi, if I'm correct, are eight points behind us. I think they're one behind Akna or one ahead of Akna. So there is games to play. And obviously, we've all got to play each other. This is the, the important thing that nobody understands. Yeah. And... You know, two games swing can change it all all completely. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's yeah. crazy, man. But I think Hermes have got a bout of COVID now, so I don't know what's going to happen there. With uh, Hermes, Paralimmi have got it as well. I think yeah, you, you know, as well. But you know who, who Hermes' president is. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to go into that again. There's a, there's a lot of things that people don't realise about Cypriot football ban. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, a strange, lot of things. Strange, a lot of things. But... Um, you got Michel Salgado as your technical director now. That came left field, didn't it? Yeah. Well, the thing is at Paphos, you know, is the owners are consistently striving to obviously get into that top six. And we've had, a, I've seen a lot of changes of director leaving here, director coming. You know, I think the Paphos people were just long and earning for uh, a stable infrastructure that can push the club football forward. You know, and if that means that Michi's going to bring in, do something that, other people haven't because we've always been told when a new person comes in right this is the way we're going hopefully that 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 can happen for the Papos people mm. there you go um, now let's switch over to Abuel a team that you mentioned a moment ago <sighs> where do I begin with them first of all I just like to laugh at them because obviously being on a on Moni Adi, watching them crumble the way they have done this season has been absolutely hilarious. In fact, it started last season. They had, they had Tramatani, they had Inga Britson, they had Uzunidis. And the beginning of the season, they started with Uzunidis. They got knocked out of the Europa League. It's almost as if they all down tools. And um, then came Mick McCarthy. Yeah. <laughs> now, again, when he got the job, the first thing I said was, he's not going to last six months, not even that. And that's not because Mick McCarthy isn't good enough. It's the fact that is how Cyprus works. Two or three bad results and you're out the door. And, um, yeah. you know, credit to Real Ferdinand and Anton Ferdinand for getting him out there. And I'm sure they, they got a, a nice uh, check from uh, Mani Dara. But at the same time, this is a club that is in free fall, was in free fall before Bursa turned up. Um, what did you make of Mick McCarthy's tenure? I think you guys played them, if I'm not mistaken, under Mick McCarthy. Oh, we didn't. No, we didn't play them. Huh? If I'm correct, he had, he had already before that game, he had already got sacked. Gone. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah. That's so, right. Sorry. Yeah. For me, obviously, look. From a personal situation, I was disappointed in the way that ended because look, I've, a guy that's played in England come to Cyprus. Now, difficult is when you're not taken by the people. I just wanted him to do well. As obviously, me being an Englishman, a man that's managed out there, he's well renowned there. 
to come and do well because it sets precedence for me in the fact that, oh, wow, these English players, staff or players can kind of come here and do well, you know. But ultimately, like you said, I think being at a football club like Apple if the results don't go in the right way, you're going to leave and get sacked. Yeah. That's just football. Mick will know that that's part and parcel of the game, you know. But disappointed to see him go, you know, but obviously it's part of football. What about Jack Byrne then? Because he went out there with quite a bit of a reputation. I know he was doing well in, in Ireland for, I think it was at Shamrock Rovers and he came to Cyprus and a lot of the Irish fans were saying, right, this guy, you know, this is a club that could elevate him, you know, into a different level. Because I know it was, uh, was he at Oldham, I think, before, if I'm not mistaken, in, in League yeah. 1 or League 2. So he's come to Cyprus and he can't even get in the first team. De ahead of him. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, the thing is with him, he is a great talent. Um... I just think when you come to Cyprus and like you're saying about the Dissentes, those type of players that have been brought in the club, big name players, I think Cyprus is always one of them places, generally what I've seen is they put those players in first, they're always going to be the pick of it, a bit of politics. Mm-hmm. I think he just needs to get himself a run of games and get himself in the team to show his talent because he's a very talented player. He's a very good player to, to a lot of my knowledge and a lot of things I've seen about him and hopefully he can turn that round and show the people how good he is. Mm. Well, there's another player, Zahid, that is an outstanding footballer, I think, for Cyprus, especially Norwegian international, I think he is. Um, played that Bantha Nagos last season. Um, but also, you guys have got Valakari and, and Var. Now, Var, yeah. I look at him and he kind of reminds me a little bit like Raheem Sterling when he was at Liverpool. Why don't you He's... say that? Because I call him Sterling. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How good is this kid? I know he's had some problems recently with the club and he went AWOL, but we're not going to, going to go into that. But in terms of his ability, because I've been I've been waxing lyrical about this. I then Hepburn Murphy, by the way. Um, yeah. So you've got three fantastic youngsters at the club. Yeah, I think um, with Vi, he's got just natural pace, quick change of direction, speed, powerful for a little boy. I think naturally he's got to work on his end product, but that will come. You know, I think he's had an up and down season for many different reasons. I think he needed to kick on this season, you know, but I think ultimately he is a Raheem, for me, a Raheem Sterling when he was at Liverpool without that in product, without the goals. It's about a coach getting that right part of him and then you've got a hell of a player. And then you go to Rushy, who's just pure pace and power. You can't get near him. Like VAR is quick, but Rushy is just another level of his pace and power. You know, and he's got a... I wouldn't say Rush is a natural finisher, but he's got a great, powerful right foot shot when he gets on the outside of people. You know, he needs to work on his finishing, his box play if he's going to be a striker. You know, mm-hmm. so they're two very talented players. But I think ultimately those players, I wouldn't say they need to lift Paphos because it's a team game, but I think Paphos needs to do well for people to really see how good they are for people to start mm-hmm. taking note and saying, right, you know what, this player can go to the next level or he can go to that level. But I think there's quite a few players in this league that can do that. And people will say to me, oh, you're biased. I'm like, no, I, I, believe me, I've t- turned my attention to the League for the past couple of seasons because I've seen the Premier League for years. I've seen the Serie A, I've seen Bundesliga. Yeah. But this is a league that, you know, this is obviously my background. But I, I look at players and, you know, like Val, like Valakari, like Joniza, Omonia, Loizu. I know that players with the right application and the right training can make it into, I'm not saying like like a Liverpool or a Man United, but they can make it a Newcastle. They can make it a, I don't know, Frank. Yeah, the only thing I will say to you, I understand that. I think from a technical point of view, I think they'll be fine. Mm-hmm. I just think generally, from a physical point of view, the Premier League is three levels above this. And people don't realise that. They think you play in the heat and stuff like that, but physicality-wise from the Premier League is completely different. And I think that's where, and I don't mean to say thing physical of the contact, I mean the physicality of people's fitness. People think, yeah, I'm fit here. Yeah, they are fit players. They are. But the fitness of Premier League players is a completely different level of that constant running non-stop in the game. Yeah. It's completely different to here. Yeah, but see, see this is it. it goes back to what we were saying before we started recording about Omoni and the Europa League this season. Yeah. Um, the f- fatigue was a massive factor. And no matter how much Henning Berg was rotating, rotating in the league games, you can't press for 70 minutes or 80 minutes or, or even yeah, 60 yeah. minutes. You know, it's, it's difficult. And that's... I think that's one massive learning curve that the Cypriot League is actually getting into now because we're getting more and more um, established footballers such as yourself. Jordi Gomez is there, uh, business who you know he's played for Bark and he's he's come out there now. So slowly, slowly, I think the Cypriot League is getting there. One thing I'm surprised about, I think that I think I'm disappointed because this season, I think last season you could see the teams that was always going to be up there and stuff like that. But I think this season with the 14 teams, I think it's made it more competitive. I actually quite like the fact of having 14 teams. And I think 
for Cypriot football, like you're saying, of people recognising Cypriot football, if you're putting 14 games in, you're putting more intensity into the games because there's now more games. People are getting more games. They're getting that little bit fitter, that stronger, the mm. teams that are not playing in Europe. That can only grow the league. And I think the competitiveness, I think next season when it goes back to 12, you'll lose a bit of that competitiveness that you had this season. I think you had that. And I think that's that for me, that's personally shown in the top half of the table as well, mm. of where, especially that half of where you're at and the bottom half, I think. Mm. You, but more so for me in the top half of, of where you're kind of at. Fair comment. Okay, um, back to um, Cypriot English players, so to speak. Marcus Edwards, who I mentioned earlier, he's doing very well in Portugal. Um, he was known, known as the Pochettino's Messi at Spurs, yeah. which is quite yeah, remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's obviously half Cypriot, as, as I mentioned earlier, and he can qualify for the national team. Now, would you advise him to consider going for the Cypriot national team? The reason why I ask is because as I've spoken to many people about his ability and you look at the England squad at the moment, you've got Rashford, Kane, Sancho, Sterling, uh, Grealish, uh, you've got Bellingham now in the fold. You've got so many players in attacking positions. He's really got to work hard or even move to a big Premier League club for Gareth Southgate to, to pay attention to him. Um, look, I think for him on a personal note, if he feels that his roots is Cypriot, he's got to go with his heart. If that's what he feels that he should do and that's a family decision or a personal decision, I think he should do that. But I think from a footballing decision, I think the kid's got to look at trying to get himself back into that Tottenham team. If he does or not, I think if he gets himself into that team and he says, right, I want to play for England, then he gets in the England team. You know, if he doesn't and he feels like, right, no, I'm Cypriot, I want to play for Cyprus regardless, then I think it's a no-brainer. Mm. I think that's a personal decision. A lot of people look at, I look at things like the Antonio situation, obviously, at West Ham. He's obviously always been chasing that England call-up, but then it gets to a point where you realise and think, right, I'm not going to get in there. You know, and obviously he's gone to Jamaica where his roots of his family is, and that would be massive for Jamaica. Now, what you don't want is with Marcus is obviously to be making that decision at that late age, you mm -hmm. know, because you're missing out on things. Look, in football, you never know. People will sit down right side up and say, yeah, they can never make it into a Euros or to a World Cup. Football, you never know. You get a luck of a draw, you get some good results. I'm not being funny. Look at Iceland when, or Greece, sorry, when they won the Euros. You know, no one saw that coming. You know, so that yeah. these these are things that are possible. So <laughs> let's talk about managers here now, because you know you mentioned the three that uh, are at Buffalo at the moment that were there this season, but you've been coached by Holloway, uh, Fairclough at Barnet. You had Warnock. You mentioned loads of different managers, loads of different personalities. Um, but the one I want to talk about is Alan Pardew who is, a, I think yes. he's a technical director at Seska Sofia at the moment. Um, yeah. And I've got a good friend that actually works there as a goalkeeping coach. He tells me he's such a nice guy. Um, yeah. I don't know how, how often he, he spends time in Bulgaria, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but it's a club that's linked with Watford, I believe, because I think they've got a couple of players out there on loan. Um, and this is the Italian link with the Pozzos. But um, Pardew, that, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, that, that FA Cup final dance. Um, <laughs> what, what was that all about, man? Honestly, I, I couldn't tell you, you know, that's a question you'd have to ask him. I think it was just one of the moment things. Um, Pards has got that character about him. Um, and but, probably, if I'm honest with you, deep down inside, I think probably him and all the other 40,000 Palace fans thought we were going to win it because we had such a good team that was so strong into holding the lead. If it was one nil up or two nil up or in, in, in big games, we held that lead, defended very well. So it was... Probably a sense of overjoyment, I would say. Mm. Well, he, he signed you at Southampton, didn't he? Is that, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, I had two like stints with him. I was with him at Southampton for a, a year, and then I'd done two and a half years with him at Palace. So, yeah, I had a, quite a bulk of my career considering how managers come and go. Well, it was quite incredible. He got that, was it that nine year deal at Newcastle, or was it seven years? I can't remember. I can't, he got, yeah, he got, something got, crazy in Newcastle. I think, yeah, I think, well, I think they've done the same with Steve Bruce. It's just, Look, for me, Mike Cashy, regardless of what people say to him, or he has always been loyal to his managers. Mm -hmm. I think I think he's only probably sacked, I think maybe one or two managers, I'm not too sure, or one or two managers at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I can't really complain about that. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, you've you got a certain owner at your club at the moment who mm -hmm. is trying to do things a certain way. I want to take you all the way back to Barnet. And a guy called Tony mm -hmm. Cleanthus. Yeah, yeah, Tony, yeah. <laughs> Scrooge. <laughs> well, it's funny because when I was younger, I went to school with a guy that 
he said that Tony Planters was his uncle. You know, no, you know what Cyprus are like. We know everyone and we're related to someone in one way, shape, or form. And it turns out it was his uncle. Um, but he always used to take him to Underhill back in the day, and he really enjoyed playing for Barnet. But in terms of the the ethos of the club at the time, because it wasn't like um, there's a lot of experienced players there, weren't there? I think Andy Hessen Tyler was there. Who else was there? Uh, Paul Warhurst. Sioli yeah. was there as well. I think he scored yeah, he a goal for, yeah. for Stevenage against Newcastle, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he scored the goal for Stevenage against Newcastle, yeah. There you go. But you were fairly young, but you had people like Barry Cogan there, Adam Adam Gross was there, was it? Adam Gross? Trezor Candle? Yeah, Adam Gross, he was there. Trezor Candle was there. Nicky Bailey was there. Dean Sinclair was there while I was there. You yeah, we had quite a decent, some good players that played at a high level at the time as well. And what some players it? that went on to a higher level. But, but what was, I want to know, what was the partying like, man? Come on, because you guys were still young in those days. You must nah, have just... do you know what? To be fair, Barton, it weren't really... It was weird at Barton. As much as, like, yeah, we was together, it was because you, you didn't have a proper training ground. You didn't have mm. a proper bus. You didn't have a canteen. It was almost like you come to training, you train, you leave. That's just sort of the... It weren't a professional club where they'd just come out the league like that as such. Right, you know, right. so it was it was a bit different, you know. But it was a great place. I think Underhill Stadium, I loved it. Tony Kulanthos, um, look, obviously they're down in the National League now, which I didn't like to see, but he's done fantastic. Built the stadium. Um, he he doesn't make the club go into debt. You know, he doesn't try and go overboard with the budget and stuff like that. So you have to give him that credit. I also think that. For me, I think he needs to have a push when they get back into the league because I think it's a great, it's a great spot where it is in London. Mm-hmm. You know, being in North London where it is is a good part of London. I think if Barnet do make that push, I think they can get their source up there a little bit. And there's a good relationship with Arsenal, isn't there? Because they do have a lot of uh, yeah. Arsenal, game, if right? I'm correct, is no. So Arsenal don't use it. Now. Arsenal use a different stadium, but they used to use their stadium, didn't they? Mm. That's yeah. right. Uh, the Hive and then Underhill before that, yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you were at Plymouth uh, with Sturrock, is that right? Yeah, Paul Sturrock. What was he like? Because I hear a lot of stories about how he was a bit authoritarian, <laughs> authoritative. Um, that's the words, you know. With Paul Sturrock, he was at the time I was at Plymouth. He was a bit ill. Um, so Sturrock was a bit old school set in his ways um, I wouldn't say I generally had a problem with him personally I think that he just had his way and I think the way that I played football um, didn't work for him I was too technical of a football player you know so it's right. just one of them things Roberto Di Matteo he was one of yeah. your coaches as well wasn't he uh, yeah MK. MK Donzio had him yeah 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 and that was after Paul Lintz had left is that right? Yeah, so Paul... Yeah, Paul Lintz was first and... In... No, Di Matteo was first in Ince, sorry. Oh, right, okay. So, oh, well, what I had, Ince was there, Di Matteo came, then Di Matteo left and then Ince came back. Right, okay. Because yeah. 90 is a good mate and um, he was he was, <laughs> <laughs> he was at MK Dons with Paul Lintz and they, they didn't get on. Um, and then Di Matteo obviously came in. I think 90 had gone by that time. I think he'd gone to Swansea or was it Brighton? I can't remember one of the two clubs that he went to. Um, but yeah, Di Matteo, he won the Champions League with Chelsea. But w- did you see that coming? I mean, obviously he, he started his uh, managerial career kind of down at the bomb, wasn't he? So did, no, did you I see didn't him? see that. Co- no, I didn't see. I didn't see that coming at all. If I'm honest with you, for the, no disrespect to him for the way he managed that uh, at MK Dons, I didn't see that in him. Um, no, but you know, obviously, when you're managing a team like Chelsea with those players with all that ability, what more can you ask? You know, mm-hmm. yeah, true, true. It, it was a remarkable experience for him, anyway. And then he got sacked after getting the job full time, but <laughs> probably there. But... You mentioned Pardew earlier and how he signed you at Southampton, but that was around about the time when Godeza took over, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah, Brilliant 10 guy. point, 10 point gap, or sorry, 10 point deduction at the beginning of the season, yeah. So, so Cortese took over at the start of that season. I think, yeah, Pardew was their first manager. They brought in, they brought in Pardew. Yeah. yeah. So you guys were on a hiding to nothing from the moment he took over. Is that right? I mean, 10-point deduction. Yeah, you're... look, Cortese, Nicola was a very hard guy to work for. Stern, wanted everything his way. But ultimately, he created an infrastructure at Southampton that was to bring success and to get themselves back into the Premier League within 
I think he had a four-year plan. Mm. First season, we didn't make it. Second season, did third season. So they got there a year ahead of plan. And it's funny you say that because you talk about expectations or realistic or pushing people. I remember Cortese turned around and said to us at um, the start of the season, right, you're not getting no bonus if you don't finish in the top 10. We're like, well, the first <laughs> season in the Premier League is that. No, we want this club to be in the top 10. We believe that these players are good enough and stuff like that. And then you think, OK, and then he done it. We got, I think we've got a certain amount of places. And then the next year, I think they, where did they finish? Eighth, I think Southampton under the mm. The next year, eighth. Yeah, eight. I left up part way through that season, but yeah. And just the things he created, and he did, I'll be honest with him, he did create a family environment there. That was one thing that was good with him. He created a family environment for all the players, wives, children, to feel like there was a family together. And mm-hmm. that's why I've got to give him a lot of credit for that. He put his money where his mouth is as well, isn't it? I think he spent £3 yeah, million pound that summer, wasn't it? Yeah, well, the thing is, it wasn't actually his money was it it was Marcus Lieber's money he was the chairman <laughs> that was his friend but what what Nicola did do well was he ran it well he put all the right things in place for the football club and all that stuff all the stuff the, the new tra- new training ground and stuff like that mm. it's an interesting yeah. time I guess but I mean I think your first season he signed Jose Font John Watson Mabor, who's a really nice guy really really nice guy yeah yeah um, and well, that Lambert. season me yeah John Watson Ricky Lambert Jose Font a Radi Diaidi signed. Um, he was he coaching at Southampton up until recently, wasn't he? Yeah, he signed Dean Hammond. Obviously, the most marquee signing you're going to say is Ricky Lambert. What he mm. went on to do was, with, and Jose, for me, fantastic. What they achieved. And then you got to look at Pardew. Pardew brought in Chamberlain into the first team. Um, then, obviously, Atkins brought in Luke Shaw, James Wood-Prowse. And Prowse is obviously an ever-present player that's involved in the first team now as well. Yeah, quality player right there. Great set pieces. <laughs> um, Punch, there's only one more thing I want to uh, discuss. And um, it goes back to my team, Omonia. So we're going to go back to Cyprus again. And, uh, you know, we're, we're four points clear at the top. I think you might feel a little bit aggrieved you didn't get a penalty in the last minute against us um, a few months ago. When uh, Les yeah. Hatch was, yeah. Because I was watching, yeah. I'm thinking, what, what was the referee given here? Because he went to VAR and it took him about seven minutes to, to figure out what had happened. And, yeah. okay, Lejax kicked the ball against Heber Murphy's face and it was a high boot. I, I don't know why an indirect free kick wasn't given, you know, if, if at minimum that. Um, but, yeah, my heart was in my mouth at the time, to be fair. Yeah, I just think, look, for me, is this is where I think in other leagues, VAR has been an advantage. Mm. I feel that Cyprus has it improved it. I don't think so. I think it's improved it for little things, but I think the decision makings, the game decision makings, it hasn't improved it because it's either foul or it's not. There is guidelines that say it's not, but it still then does come down to in Cyprus, does the referee want to give it or not? And that's ultimately it. And if it is the decision that's going to change the game, does that referee want to make that decision? And it seems like that is not the case. The scary thing is, I've noticed a pattern. It's almost as if, if a team doesn't get a decision one week, they'll get another decision the following week. It's, it's, it's weird how they deliberately... It's almost as if they try to deliberately balance it out. It's unbelievable. Mm. Um, but yeah, this, this team of mine that's, you know, four points clear at the top, we've, we've been very lucky. We've got a brand new owner that is looking after the club. He's going to spend money on a, on a training facility, you know, rebuilding it. I think it's five million. He's uh, dedicated to it. Um, he's helped us clear the debt slowly, slowly. Henning Berg's come in as head coach and he's done a remarkable job. He's blooding youngsters, John is, Luis um, But when you look at this team that you've played against, obviously uh, on numerous occasions, are there any particular players that stand out for you? Because people don't really know Cypriot football as much. So you being an established former Pro League footballer, looking yeah. as a, you know, I'd say a resident of Cyprus now, <laughs> what do you make of this team? Yeah, the guy, um, correct me saying, is Gabadidis? Is that his name? How do I say the left back? The left back. Lejax. Lejax, sorry. Lejax, he's a, for me, he's a player that can play in the Premier League. Just his fitness, the way he gets up and down, very, very good player. And obviously, the goalkeeper you got, he's a good goalkeeper. Yeah, he's he's kept us in a lot of games this season. Yeah, good goalkeeper. You know, I think they're, for me, they're the two main players that stand out. For me, that when I've played against them, where I look at them and think, you know what, yeah, they could play in a different level. But I do generally, think, obviously, Jordi, I've played against him. I know how he plays. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, I just think that, like I said before, I think 
it's Ammonia's league to lose. I think they've been strong from the start of the season, you know, and I think going into the, the, this part of the season is p- pinnacle for them. Mm. And uh, one more thing, the youngsters, uh, Johnny's that's broken through, Loizo, who scored a fantastic goal the other day against Ajax. Um, we got a lot of hopes on on those two players. And I was talking to uh, Robert... Um, Joseph Kozle, sorry, the other the other day, former Armenian striker, he's Slovakian, but he still keeps an eye on the club. And he's telling us that he practically, not wouldn't say discovered Johnny is, but he knew him as a 12-year-old, knew his dad and kind of pushed him to join Armonia. And he's one of our one of our high hopes, to be fair. So in terms of looking at the Cypriot youngsters and just plays in general from the island, are there any other ones that stand out for you? Obviously, non, non-nationals, uh, non-international, uh, sorry. Um... Because I don't take this in the wrong way. Obviously, I <laughs> I do take note of the players that I'm playing against, and obviously I get confused sometimes yeah. with the Greek and separate players. Of course, if, if, of course. If, but the one boy that played the other day, I know he came from Tottenham. Oh, but George, I saw him. You're you. The, yeah, the, the kid that played for Ayo. Yeah, he's too good. I can tell you, he's too good for this league already. You should I not in a disrespectful way. Okay, he's mm. come here to play games, but he won't be here long. He definitely won't be here long. He's a very, 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 very good player. Yeah, he was at Spurs, he went to Ipswich, I think, and then he went to Ayl. So, yeah, he was stuck in January. Very, good little player. Very, very good player. Very good player, and I saw him. And obviously, maybe sometimes I'm a bit biased because I think that when I look at players, I'm judging them on the Premier League. I should judge them on how the Cyprus football yeah. is. But there is a lot, a lot, a lot of top, top players for me. Excellent. Punch, listen, it's been absolutely great talking to you, man. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and I hope that we can do this again because it's you know your your knowledge of Cypriot football is just fantastic, man. For someone that's only been there eighteen months, it's uh it's refreshing talking to someone such as yourself that's obviously played at the highest level, and now you're in Cyprus looking at the environment and you know someone like me and obviously the Greek community in North London, you know very well. <laughs> well just on punch on, he's on your show. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, hopefully we can get another one end of the season. So that's it for another episode of Shoot the Defense. We'll be back very, very soon. Till next time, take care.